Welcome back to the next session, uh, which is the regulation and financial services. And obviously, we looked at the satisfaction in the previous section. And we said that um, customer satisfaction is actually tied to, in the financial services, actually tied to you know, consumers' welfare and consumers' livelihood. And so we can actually understand why the regulatory framework is very, very important you know, in customer services, uh, in, in financial services provision. And I think it, financial services is one of the highly regulated you know, industries in the market. Why? Because of the very reason, as we said, of uh, welfare, people's welfare and people's livelihood. So therefore, the framers of the laws have to be very particular about you know, the services provided by financial services in order that people don't actually get the kind of shocks that we're actually saying they could get if you provide a very bad customer services or if you provide a very bad services in financial sector. So the regulation or the regulatory framework is very, very crucial in this market. So as usual session overview, we look at financial services is greatly affected by an area of regulations which guide the scope of companies' marketing activities. While some of these regulations may only affect marketing activities for specific categories of financial services, others affect such activities across the entire sector. Again, the session outline and then the reading list you know, as provided. So we're supposed to do an in-class exercise and we say individually consider financial product which you may have had dissatisfaction with as a consumer. And this one I can actually tell a very close you know, kind of experience. And uh, myself, I've had you know, with a financial provider, uh, financial service provider, which was an insurance. You know, after having an accident, you expect that your insurance company will be very empathetic enough when you had reported it to send you a letter to say, oh, we're so sorry. We, had, we just heard that you've had an accident. We know this is a very traumatic period that you're in. Uh, we, we actually you know, empathize with you and we wish you a speedy recovery. However, as your insurance provider, we'll make sure that you, know, you get the necessary support, not necessarily committing themselves that they are going to uh, provide you with the insurance uh, with reinstatement, but of course, because they've got to investigate and see you know, uh, what happened before they can commit to that. But of course, nothing stops them to say, we'll give you the needed support you know, for you to come through this. Nothing of that sort was received. No conversation, no communication from them. I kept calling them and saying, listen, I've sent you my particulars, my documents, I haven't heard from you, I haven't even acknowledged receipt. And still nothing came from them officially. Later on, the note or the letter that I received, the only letter that I received, was a bang on in my face to say that we are sorry, we can't pay your claims. <laughs> that was very, very interesting. So yeah, I can, I can actually you know, uh, relate to this one, and I'm sure most of you can actually relate in one way or the other to this particular exercise. So let's see. Uh, so what regulatory measures do you think would be necessary to ensure that your rights as a consumer are being protected? And what do you think should be in charge or who do you think should be in charge of enforcing the regulation? Now, let me say that when it comes to the financial sector in Ghana, for example, especially in the banking sector, now the regulation or the regulator that is supposed to be responsible for the sector is also the same person which is in charge of consumer rights and protection which I really can get because, of course, if the people who actually sit on the table with the central bank to determine their sector would be the same people with which we entrust, you know, um, the uh, consumer protection and consumer rights you know, activities to them, then, of course, it's like the players being or the, the, the team being a, a referee at the same time. So people would never get fair judgment. So I think in Ghana's situation, the central bank may do as much as possible to make sure that that, that arm of consumer protection and consumer complaint actually is kind of rationalized, uh, rationalized from the central bank as an independent entity. And I know that there is only one person. Who, anyway, that's the only person that I've heard campaigning for consumer rights and protection, which is Kofi Kafito. 
Capito, I think, yeah, is, 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 his name is Kofi Capito. I think he's the only person, you know, trumpet in consumer protection and consumer rights. And I think that if we can get so many Kofi Capitos in this country, that would help because the industry is actually growing. However, the activism part is not growing alongside it. And it's only the activism part that would actually make people well informed and for people to know their rights as financial consumers. And I think that is in the interest of the banks and the financial services providers largely or widely to support the activities of Kofi Capito, for example, and any other you know, people or persons that would actually rise for consumer rights. Because when you do that, when you support the activities, then what you're essentially doing is you are letting them train people, letting them make people aware of their rights and responsibilities as far as financial services is concerned. So that you don't burden yourself with you know, educating consumers you know, how they should engage your service, which is crucial. So once you can actually support someone to do that job for you, half of your difficulties are solved because then people are not gonna have things to complain about because they would know how the engagement rules are and whether they are doing something right or wrong, you know, without necessarily coming to your doorsteps. So I think the financial services are in a very good position and they can perform better if they can support such, you know, you know, non-governmental agencies to do their work for them, i.e. educating consumers their rights and responsibilities as far as financial services is concerned. So rationale for regulating financial services, as we know, financial services are directly linked to consumers' wealth and welfare, and therefore financial services quality cannot be precisely measured as goods and quality can, um, and as a result, yeah, as goods and services can be measured, obviously you can't measure specifically qualities of financial services. So there are variations you know, in people's thoughts, people's you know, measurement of what quality is, like we said, it is perception based. Financial services transactions are often irreversible and long term. So it means when there's a damage, you affect, if you say customer has paid and you say he hasn't paid, obviously it goes to their credit records and that could take about five years to be wiped out. So you get someone into bad credit ratings as a result of your inefficiencies, and that could be very long term, and that could be serious. Again, we said that there's asymmetric information. Always the financial service provider is much more powerful than the consumer because of the nature of it. You know, they know much more the industry and things. It's one of the great areas that people don't really have a step in you know, or a leg in in terms of understanding. So there's always this asymmetry of power where the provider is much more powerful and then the consumer seems to entrust almost everything to the provider. Financial service provider can influence customers' permanent credit score uh, records, like I said earlier on. Credit ratings are done by whether the person is honest enough to pay on time or not. And if the person has paid on time and your records show that they haven't actually paid on time, you do more damage to their credit scores and their, and their future, future needs. So bank regulations, I think this one is purely, you know, uh, the first one is much more, you know, foreign. This one, a deposit taking financial institution, example bank, has to apply for a license issued by the regulator, which is the Central Bank of Ghana. Limited number of licenses are issued by regulators, obviously, when it comes to financial services. And an objective regulation on deposit taking institutions to protect consumers and to promote competition and then to facilitate distribution of financial resources. Specific regulations so far in Ghana, since 2003, universal banking has replaced the three pillar banking. So we used to have uh, banks only earmarked for uh, investment or uh, in, uh, in industry. Uh, what we used to, we used to have, uh, uh, what do you call, UMB used to be uh, uh, merchant banking. So we used to have merchant bank commercial, and then we used to have uh, what we call like agricultural and that kind of thing. So, but now we have universal bank, which means a bank can apply as a you can apply as a universal, which means you can trade in almost everything, whether investment, merchant, you know, commercial or agriculture. So, yeah, uh, we used to have development, merchant, and commercial banks. You know, but now it's universal, so you can actually apply for all to, 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 to work in all. So it has leveled the playing field and opened up the system to competition, product innovation and entry, 
stringent fiscal policies, devaluation of the currency, prices were liberalized, and so were the rate of interest. It was only in 1987 that the rules pertaining to minimum deposit as well as maximum deposit were abolished. The interest rates which were embraced there, thereafter was more inclined towards the market conditions. This transformation occurred in the year 1988 when the FinSAP or Financial Sector Structure Adjustment Program was adopted by the country. So much more to do with the external you know, environment impacting on the, the local environment or the microenvironment. So bank advertising is, again, one of the highly regulated you know, areas in, in the financial services. And like I said, because the financial services is actually linked to people's livelihood and people's welfare, you know, some of these claims, for example, in advertising could be very serious. And as a result, there must be you know, some regulations to make sure that people actually are stating the right things or actually advertising the, the right thing. So you have interest rate, for example, has to be advertised for a 12-month period. Interest might be stated as if there were no compounding. And at advertising for time deposit must explicitly state penalties for early withdrawals, full disclosure of loan information, partial information not allowed, and then member FDI, FDIC for ads by re related deposits by member banks. Insurance regulation. So like banking, obviously, uh, the financial sector in total. You know, also there are certain regulations and motivations are that to ensure individuals have access to insurance and protect consumers, to accommodate economy-wide risks, to promote competition, and to ensure cons consumers understand the insurance product being sold to them. Ghana Insurance Act 2006 actually highlights you know, most of the insurance uh, regulations and policies you know, that govern the sector. So provision of unlicensed insurance businesses, restriction on contact with the offshore insurer, insurer to carry on insurance business only, capitalization, solvency, and financial resources, approval of premium and, uh, premium and rates by the commission, etc. And then these are the continuation of the you know, kind of uh, the insurance regulations. I think it's, it's actually on the central bank's website. These are you know, clearly stated there. You can actually see it. So other regulatory requirements, minimum capital requirement to start an insurance firm, exit or reserve capital requirements, and asset allocation. The National Association of Insurance Commissioner has a guidelines for insurance operations, codes, and conduct. Of course, the sector is actually you know, uh, regulated by National Insurance Commission, which is NIC. So these are more of the, the rest of the regulations in insurance companies, uh, in the insurance industry. So again, uh, insurance advertising regulation, National Association of Insurance Commissioners develops model rules which are subsequently adopted by individual states, or uh, this, this one is actually international. Uh, but you know, in Ghana, for example, like I said, the NIC actually is the one that regulates you know, the, the industry. And on their website, you could actually find most of the regulation, I mean, all the regulation framework, the regulation framework there. Um, now, what we have seen is the development of mobile money, which is a new phenomenon in our, our sector, our, our, our country, for example. And in 1994, the Telecommunication Accelerated Development Plan was launched. Now, this policy was meant to liberalize and revamp the sector through the participation of the private sector to meeting the changing needs of Ghanaians, both in their social and business life. So the tele mobile banking was supposed to be a branchless banking facility, you know, and that was supposed to you know, help bridge the, the gap. And we said that there are almost about 70% people unbanked in this in this country. So the mobile banking or the mobile money actually came to fill most of these gaps and to make sure that there's a connectivity between the wider society and the non-banked. And it has really, really contributed to financial inclusion in this country in a very much. And then other related regulations, financial sector reform program, FinSAP in 1988 to 2000, liberalization of interest rate and abolition of direct, you know, directed you know, credit restructuring of financial distressed banks, financially distressed banks, strengthening of the regulatory 
and supervisory framework, promotion of non-bank financial institutions, discount houses, etc. Again, more of the regulations, 1989 Banking Act, and then Bank of Ghana Law 1992, PNDC in a Law 291, Security Industry Law 1993, PNDC Law 333. All these are some of the regulatory frameworks in a governing the financial services in a sector. Other related regulations continuous, you know, even some of the new ones. Universal banking law, we've started abolition of secondary reserve requirements. Bank Act 2004, we've mentioned it. Long Term Savings Act, Venture Capital Trust Fund, Established Act 2004, Payment System Act 2003, Foreign Exchange Act 2006, Anti Money Laundering Act 2008, Credit Reporting Act 2008, and other you know, listings here. I think almost all these now can be found on the, you know, the central bank's website. Of course, what is of interest again is the Ghana Interbank Payment and Settlement System, the GIFs, which is widely, you know, uh, kind of pu publicized. We have the eSwitch, which is the, you know, cashless society effort or initiatives, you know, kind of, you know, uh, being pushed by the central bank and other related agencies. So this is a GIFs, you know, kind of system. When you go to the website, this is how it looks. Ghana Interbank Payment and Settlement Systems Limited. They also are very much championing, you know, uh, the cashless society. All right. So that's the a bit yeah, about the regulatory work. framework or the regulation, you know, of the financial services in Ghana. Quite extensive information could be, you know, had from the central bank website and I think the national national insurance commission's website and other related agencies you know you can get more information from this so thank you so much for this session and I look forward to the last session thank you